Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Let's Have a Conversation podcast. I am Elizabeth Fortner, your host and the Marketing and Outreach Specialist for the Education for Children and Youth Experiencing Homelessness Program here in Region 3, or as we like to say, heck yeah. Did you know that May is National Foster Care Awareness Month? This month is about drawing attention to the needs of children and youth in foster care. And as an Ek Yeah team member, I'm proud to say that we work hard to ensure that foster care youth receive educational stability and support. So let's talk about numbers. Did you know that in a year, there are nearly 20,000 children in the foster care system in PA? It's a staggering figure that highlights the importance of initiative, initiatives like ours. And one of the biggest challenges for foster care students is education. And that is why the Every Student Succeeds Act, also known as ESSA, was so important. It allows these students to stay in the same school even if they move to a new foster home. And this provision, it eliminates the negative effects of frequent school changes on the academic progress of foster youth. And as someone who was also in the foster care system, I know firsthand how difficult it can be to maintain academic progress while moving around so much. But I also know that it's very much possible to overcome those challenges and succeed. So today I am joined by my colleague, Missy Gosnell. And today we are honored to have Rachel Miller as our guest speaker. So welcome, Rachel. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So Rachel, she is the policy director for PA Partnerships for Children, focused on child welfare and K-12 education. And her goal is to ensure that every child has access to a loving family and a high quality education free from abuse and neglect. So let's dive in. So welcome, Rachel, again. I appreciate having you on our podcast, and it was lovely to have you on our Lunch and Learn. Um, so just to start off the conversation, I did it briefly explain or share what you do, but can you go ahead and just share with us briefly about yourself, how you became the policy director for PA Partnership for Partnerships for Children, and also share a little bit about what PA Partnerships for Children is all about. Yes, thank you again for having me and on such an important time right now um, during National Foster Care Month. So a little background on Pennsylvania Partnerships for Children. We are an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit advocacy organization that focuses on improving outcomes for children in Pennsylvania prenatally through transition to adulthood. We have several policy areas where we focus, but my portfolio includes child welfare and K-12 education, and the intersections of those policy areas. I focus on state and national legislative, administrative, and fiscal policy reforms in the er these areas. Um, so we do our work through a multiple strategy approach, such as data analysis and research, coalition building, community engagement, and legislative and administrative reform. But I actually started my career working for a child welfare agency and I served in several different roles um, at that agency. In the 10 years that I was there, I did both direct service case management and supervision, but I ended my career as a quality improvement manager and educational liaison. In that role, I found that state and local policy impacts outcomes for children and families in practice. And in order to change those outcomes, advocacy was a necessary component. So that led me to my position now as a policy director, which I've been doing for almost six years. Well, that's great. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. And Rachel, for our Lunch and Learn, you really emphasize on National Foster Care Awareness Month. So can you just share a little bit why this month is so important and why we need to increase that awareness 
Absolutely. I mean, foster care month shouldn't be something that we are celebrating, um, but unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. foster care placement is sometimes necessary um, to ensure the safety of children. Um, but it's really an important time for us to recognize those children and youth that are actually in the system. Um, but not only those children and youth, those parents and caregivers that are working to reunify with them, the pra practitioners that support these communities, um, and to have a community conversation on ways to improve the system. It allows us to replace myths and misconceptions with facts and work together to identify solutions that improve the outcome uh, for those children that require out-of-home placement. Yeah, and you talk about misconceptions. So what are those? I can only uh, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many misconceptions that the public have about foster care. Mm -hmm. um, so the first being that foster care placement is caused by child abuse and the need for child safety. Um, the fact is that the top five reasons for children entering out-of-home care include um, child behavior problems, parents' inability to cope, neglect, parental substance use, and inadequate housing. So it's not your traditional abuse, such as physical or sexual abuse. Yeah. Um, there's <clears throat> also a belief that parents and caregivers are unable to safely keep their children and are unable to effectively reunify. Um, the fact is socioeconomic conditions and poverty are often the leading drivers to neglect and with increased prevention efforts, such as social safety nets, and community-based programming, we can actually stabilize families to avoid former foster care placement. Um, additionally, Pennsylvania has a high rate of reunification for foster children. So that demonstrates that parents have the ability to change and can correct behaviors that lead to placement. Um, but lastly, there's often a misconception that children and youth are safer in foster care or they're in need of out-of-home placement. Um, this is false. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, um, children who experience foster care often have poorer outcomes compared to their peers in the general population. And this includes education attainment, housing, employment, and things like your physical health, behavioral health, and mental health. Yeah. And I can speak to that personally that, you know, me being in foster care was due to neglect and also substance abuse on both parents. And you know, being placed in the foster care system then is probably different than it is now. I see a lot of reunification happening. Unfortunately, we didn't have that opportunity. Every time we try to reunify, something happened either with, you know, ch children and youth or biological parents just did not do what they were supposed to. But I kind of feel like there wasn't as many supportive services in place to help you know, my biological mother or my biological father and trying to keep us all together. I think over the last 10 years, we've really seen a shift in policy of really focusing on primary prevention efforts. So what are those services and supports in the community that can help stabilize families? Not looking at taking kids out of their home because they're having challenges with economic security or loss of housing or you know, parenting struggles. How do we set up those services in the home to help keep those children there and help the parents work on those issues that are leading to um, the neglectful situations? Mm -hmm. um, we've also seen a huge shift in policy regarding keeping children in family-based placements. So really ensuring that kinship care is that first option um, with then looking at stranger foster care or a higher level of care being the option of last resort. Um, and I'll get into some data here in a little bit, yeah. but I think um, for a state, Pennsylvania has been doing a really nice job of trying to implement these efforts to try to keep families intact and stabilized and ensure that children are really in the least restrictive setting as possible. And you talk about it being the last resort and that kinship reduces trauma. So I'm not saying that they can't experience trauma, but what is it about being placed with a family member as opposed to someone who's a stranger that will reduce that trauma that students ex or youth experience in the foster care system. So placement is a traumatic experience for a child. Um, if they're placed in a stranger foster home or a congregate care setting, they are losing everything that is familiar to them. Um, their physical home, 
their family, their communities, their cultures, their religion. Often, as we know, they yeah. are changing schools. Um, that also includes friends and extracurricular activities. The loss is so great and it creates additional trauma in addition to the circumstances that led to that placement in the first place. Right. And Rachel, when we're talking kinship, we're also talking, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's related to that person. It could be like a, uh, you know, a long term, like a family, a family friend or someone who is familiar with that, with that child. Am I correct on that? That kinship is a broader definition than you're, you don't have to be, you know, true kin, if that's the term I want to use. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we are very fortunate that in Pennsylvania, we have a broad definition of kin. So you have those kin that are we're, we're most familiar with that are related by blood or marriage. So a grandparent or a cousin or an aunt or an uncle. But then also what's included in the kinship care law is anybody who has a pre-existing positive supportive connection to that child. So that includes individuals like um, maybe you have a best friend from school and their parents are really supportive of you, or maybe it's a teacher or a mentor that you've grown up with, or perhaps it's somebody that I know in my family, we had people we called aunts and uncles that weren't actually related to us, but were just the same as those blood related relatives. And so it really opens it up to looking at, um, looking to the family and the child to say, who are your supports within your network? And who is there to step in to help either support through um, helping to stabilize the family and come together or can step in and be a placement option as a formal kinship caregiver. And why is it so, and I don't know if it's like this now and you can answer that, but why is it so difficult to place a child with family? Because that could have eliminated so, like you said, trauma, it could have eliminated all that, but I felt like that was a lot harder for us at that time to be placed in kinship. I want to start on a positive note here. Pennsylvania has its highest rate of kinship care placements in history. So 42% of the foster care population are with kin, which is wonderful. That's and good. we love yeah. to see these increases over the last, you know, 10 years. However, when we think about it in the opposite way, that means 60% of children are placed with strangers, and this mm -hmm. is just not acceptable. Um, there are multiple reasons for why children are not placed with kin and or kin are excluded. Um, so the first, and I think one of the primary drivers we're seeing is that there's not adequate family finding um, occurring on the front end or if county agencies are finding relatives, they're not following up with them and saying, hey, this child is about to enter foster care or has, would you like to be considered? Um, and we know that the child welfare workforce is seriously strained right now. Um, they are overwhelmed and not able to effectively follow all required policies. So this can lead to not having outreach or contact with kin who could be licensed and be a placement resource. But then we have on the other side, um, stigma and bias when it comes mm. to kin, um, the belief that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, um, that because of their connection to the biological parents or caregivers, that they're not any better than the parents, which we know is just categorically um, untrue. But also, I, I think one a large piece, too, is this misinterpretation of statute or policy so we have um, licensing requirements that are the same for foster parents and kinship caregivers. Um, but sometimes counties or providers will impose requirements on the kin that are not necessary and make them quote unquote, jump through hoops. Um, and these requirements do not keep a child any safer, but rather creates more burdensome activities for the kinship caregiver and often weeds them out. Um, so these are really big practices that we've been looking at from a policy perspective is we know that there's a lot of kin out there that can be stepping up, can be a placement resource and qualify to be licensed. How do we get them through the process without being arbitrarily disqualified? Yeah. And my thing is, so 
do foster care children have a voice when it comes to that? Because again, we're going to keep going back and forth with me disclosing my personal experience because I think that really feeds off of everything we're talking about because things are a lot different now. But I remember there was a time in high school when they were about to switch my school district again. And I kept saying that there was this staff member from the children's home I lived at who wanted to take me in. And I voiced that. I advocated for myself. I said, I want to go live with her. Can I live with her? And they just like hard no. And it's just like, okay, well, I feel like students or foster care students, if they know that there's someone that's willing to take them in and go through all the licensing and the home visits and the inspection and everything else, why not? Yeah, I think this is really a great point to talk about youth voice in policymaking, um, you know, whether that be in a case level, um, a local level or a statewide level. So we've been conducting focus groups with youth that are age of 18 or older that have exited the foster care system. And I will tell you that it's incredibly brave and impactful in them sharing their stories. And they've all had common themes and um, in their experiences. One of them saying they did not feel heard or listened to. Um, they were very clear about their needs and what services, supports, placements could have been available to make them more successful, but nobody wanted to listen. Um, they feel like the system did not value or even request their opinions when they were making decisions about their own lives. Um, they shared too, you know, we were treated poorly in our placements um, by either foster parents or congregate care providers. They had unrealistic expectations of me um, and nobody listened to me when I complained about that. Um, similar to you, Liz, a lot yeah. of you say I had family. I had somebody that I said would take me in that I felt comfortable with and often the agency would not listen. Um, they also felt like they didn't have the right services and supports to help them process their trauma. So we talked about how placement is traumatic, no matter where they're being placed. If they're being removed from their biological homes, it's going to be trauma. Um, but the services were not either offered, had long wait lists, or were not the right fit. And so they weren't able to really address their trauma until they got into the right service. Um, and sometimes then, it's too late, like not too late, but sometimes that's not until later on. And now you have to rework all that trauma from, you know, that has just been pent up and suppressed. And then it trickles to Ooh. your adulthood because I'm not going to say that I'm over my trauma. I, I still struggle with it. But that's because I didn't work through it at that time. I'm now working through it. <laughs> so it's, yeah. you know, yeah, and there is a requirement that these services and supports be provided to, to children and youth in foster care, but you know there, we have a lot of challenges there. Um, and youth are the first ones that we should be looking to to help us understand those challenges and where do we divert our efforts and our investments to make sure that they have the services and supports that are gonna make them most successful. Um, but I think the most infuriating thing <laughs> that I heard through these focus groups is that they had no support system when they left care. They were completely disconnected from their families and their siblings. Um, you know, they, they didn't have somebody to call on when they were, you know, 18 and homeless saying, hey, can you help me find an apartment or can you help me apply for jobs? Um, they are really isolated and alone because their only support network up to that time had been paid providers, whether that be their county caseworker or foster care provider or a mental health specialist or their foster parent. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, when we talk about National Foster Care Month, I love to highlight the fact that even if Ken can't be an appropriate placement option, maybe there's some reason that they're not going to pass licensing. We still should be doing more to make sure that they're not disconnected from those people that are their natural network. Mm -hmm. I love how you highlighted the whole that they have no voice, that no one believes them, no one takes them seriously, because there has been times where, you know, I would voice my concern to my caseworker or to my guardian ad litem, and I would say, I don't feel safe in this foster home. You know, they're treating me very differently. I don't like it. Like, and they'll say, well, Liz, you know what? Give it another three months, you know, just try to stick it out. Just do what you can. There's nothing else available. And it's like, 
okay, none of you are listening to me. And I know you mentioned this in the lunch, you'll learn how some students will then run away. Well, I did. Now, I always say I ran away, but when I say that, I went to school and I never went back on that school bus and I never went back to that foster home. And she's all like, oh my gosh, Liz has never, did not come home. And it's like, what did we do? And then finally, that's when they were like, oh, okay, she's being serious. You know, we got to try to find somewhere else to go. But it's like, I had to do that and put myself in another vulnerable situation in order for people to listen. I do want to get a little bit in the educational piece when it comes to foster care. And we all know that ESSA has played a role now in ensuring that educational stability. And I did just disclose that I was in 12 different schools while in foster care. And that was due to being bounced around everywhere. And again, I know it affected my academic progress in some way, shape or form. Um, but now that the law does ensure that foster care youth are not bounced around and can remain in their school of origin. Now, of course, if that's in their best interest, I know I could have used bids in my life, <laughs> but have you noticed any like inefficiencies or ineffective policies in the system when it comes to that educational stability? Yeah, I think the biggest driver to ineffective policy implementation is currently the workforce shortage. Um, county child welfare agencies across the state are having significant challenges with filling positions. Um, I know some counties that have a 70, 80% vacancy rate. Um, this is just insane. It creates large, unmanageable caseloads so we can't expect if they're overwhelmed and they have too many cases to manage that they're going to effectively follow every policy. So this includes the bid meetings and educational stability efforts not occurring as they should. Um, additionally, an unexperienced workforce leads to staff not fully understanding or valuing the purpose of ESSA. Um, you know, we have a younger workforce and for a case worker that hasn't been at the agency very long, they, they don't quite get it yet. Um, but I want to say that educational stability is larger than just the bid meeting. Um, it's ensuring that partners are coming together, like the county caseworker, lead, uh, district liaisons, parents and caregivers, the youth that are involved, all sitting yeah. at the table to plan to ensure that that child is having all of their needs met at school to make them successful. So coordinating IEPs and 504 plans, offering tutorship, tutoring or mentorship, mm -hmm. um, inclusion of extracurricular activities and setting graduation plans. We need to not just look at this from straight A bid process, but how are we looking at the child's education stability from a holistic approach? Yeah. And I love how you say include the student or the child. Now, obviously you want to, it's a case by case. You're not going to have, you know, a six-year-old sit in on their bid meeting, but I say, you know, if you're a senior and, you know, there's a chance of having to go to a different school because your placement just changed, I should have been able to sit it. Now, I'm not saying there, it wasn't around then, but, um, you know, being able to sit in and say, well, hey, hold up. You guys are all talking about me. You're saying what you think is my best interest and you're telling me what you think is in my best interest. But don't I know what's in my best interest? And I'm pretty sure not being ripped away from all my friends and my teachers that I love and the fact that I'm getting good grades and I'm involved in extracurricular activities and the fact that I'm about to graduate, but you want to say, oh, well, she's living in this district. Let's enroll her there. And it's like, well, no, you start a new school for your senior year and you tell me how you like that. Cause that was just, you know, so I think I love that you say that. And I know it is a case by case. I know not everyone's going to want to have the student involved in a decision making, but I think depending on their age and where they're at, especially if it's during graduation or even high school years, because those are the those are the real most important years are those four years in high school and definitely not an easy time to go to a different school and to make new friends and to adapt to a whole new environment. And it's just, again, more trauma. So why not give us kids that voice to say, I don't want to go to that school. I want to stay where I'm at. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that youth engagement is a theme that I see across anything we're talking about regarding foster care, you know, whether that's education or employment. Um, and too often youth are not at the table. Um, their voices are not heard. Um, and additionally, infuse them in policy making. That is the one thing that we're looking at is, you know, they might not understand the exact process, but they are the perfect ones to identify solutions. Mm -hmm. um, just going back to, you know, you talking about, um, you know, how you weren't, your voice wasn't really heard. Um, I think that a lot of the times it's easy to just allow the child to enroll in the new school district because it doesn't require coordination. So it doesn't require transportation or a foster parent transporting a kid while transportation is set up. It's the easy route. Um, so that becomes an issue that we're seeing across the state as well is, yeah, it might be easy in the moment, but think about what this is going to cause in the long run for this child and what work is going to come with it as a caseworker to ensuring that they're on track or getting back on track. Doing this up front is actually a time saver overall. Yeah. Lucy, do you have anything you want to? Uh, I was just going to say, I think... Rachel hit on a couple of things. It's really important to get out there and, and educate, um, educate about the process and things like that. Um, I know there's different ways of views of looking at it. I And what I usually teach or when I do trainings differently with how I, uh, with school districts, I would say, you know, if this, I mean, if you're aware that this, no one has communicated with this child or communicated with this person regarding what they want, then if there's a bid meeting scheduled, it, don't have it until you know for a fact, you know what I mean? Because you've got to check all those, you know, checks and balances as to what needs to be discussed. And I think, you know, it, it's happening. You know, unfortunately, we're still having that where we truly need to educate. This is how the process sh should work. And this is why it works best. You know, because when we do end up having a, have a situation where it might not go the way we we feel it should go i think um stepping up to the plate and understanding that oh yeah i didn't think about that you know what i mean it's kind of like you know and i think sometimes the other party feels as though you're stepping on their toes or you know they ultimately have the final say so in the decision of what's being made whereas they're not seeing it from the other part of it where you know here's this you know the school district has this kid five days a week, you know, for so many hours, they do have a good handle on that child. I think sometimes more so than, you know, I mean, the, the, the placing agency. So I think education, you know, just making sure that people are aware of how the process is to work, who, you know, what you need to listen to and, and things like, you know, it's just. Um, well, Missy, I think you raise a really great point. You know, I don't think that the process isn't happening out of malicious reason. Correct. I think right. that all parties want to try to do what's best yeah. for yeah. foster youth. It becomes a time-consuming yes. process. It, it becomes does. something that there's not an understanding of why it's incredibly important. Yeah. And so the education piece is critical. Yeah. Um, I think it would be wonderful if, you know, agencies and district districts brought foster students together to talk mm -hmm. about exactly what their experience has been and how changes of schools have really impacted them, um, both positive and negative. You know, there's mm -hmm. some kids who need a change, um, but in those cases, why was it appropriate? Mm -hmm. I think that really listening to those who have the lived experience is the most impactful. Oh, heaven, Jess. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, it's it's just, you know, I've sat in, in a couple of situations. It just seems like, you know, we go so far ahead and then we step back again. You know what I mean? It, like you said, none of it's malicious. I just think it's, like you said, the turnover the rate is just horrible, you know, when it comes to the child welfare system and just trying to get educated. You know, once you get someone educated on, you know, what here's what, you know, should be taking place, that person's leaving and moving on to, you know, another position. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this whole training process. So yeah, it's, and it was really hard for me to adjust to so many caseworkers because it was a turnover for me too. Like I had one and the next, you know, Liz, you have another caseworker, but I must admit I had some great caseworkers. And unfortunately what they would say to me is this one's out of my control Liz. 
There's nothing that I can do. And I actually believe them because now I work on the other side of things and I get it. And, but I am very blessed that I had the most amazing guardian ad litem ever. She was this little five foot woman, but boy, I tell you when we came to our permanency hearings, she was always my voice and it was nice to have that. And I mean, the judge allowed me to speak too, which was kind of cool, but she was always, always on my side, 100%. Even if I couldn't get a hold of my caseworker, I could call her and she would call me right back. And I just, I can only hope that there are guardian ad items out there that are currently still doing that for these kids. There's a lot of systems out there that are, you know, like cost is a big one. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have enough people volunteering, you know yeah. what I mean, to fill that role, but every kid should have a CASA work. You know what I mean? Like someone mm-hmm. who can be there to support them, um, you know, just with the numbers that are in the system. So it, it yeah, I don't know what the, there's no easy answer. So there really you know, like you said at our lunch and learn, you know, unfortunately the, the system's never going to go away. There's always going to be a need for it. I think it's mm-hmm. just on, you know, how we, how we work together to try and just like do what's best for these kids. Uh, you know, these children and youth that are in foster care, um, making well, sure they it. thrive and succeed. Yeah. Well, let's face it. Everybody that goes into one of these roles, whether it be an educator or a child welfare caseworker or a guardian at light up, they go into this wanting to help, mm-hmm. not yes. cause harm. And it's often because they're so overwhelmed yeah. that they don't then have the ability to do their job mm-hmm. in the ways that they really want to. So I think one of the key pieces I'd love to highlight is in National Foster Care Month, we should also be looking at workforce. How are we supporting our workforce? Yeah. How are we getting really good recruited and retained right. yeah. uh, workers across these systems? And yeah. then, then they should be able to work together more effectively. Yeah, I yeah. agree. We should definitely appreciate them because huh, I know firsthand they had their hands full with me because, you know, I, and I'm sure other foster kids can speak to this. We're not easy to deal with at times, but also... They've heard their fair share that you don't know what I'm going through. So how can you help me? And, but I know it wasn't their fault. It's not their fault that they weren't in foster care, that they didn't experience what I experienced, but they're there willing to help. Although I used to think they're not doing anything because no one's calling me back. I can truly understand that it wasn't a personal attack. It wasn't, oh, Liz, we can't help you out or anything like that. It's, we have so many other kids too. And yeah, we may not know what you're going through, but we're here trying to help you. I always thought they were against us because they're the ones who ripped us out of our home and separated all of us for how many years. So I always had that. I always had that stigma towards children (laughs) and youth, but now I'm I'm on the other side of it. Liz, I was the same way. You know, I had really bad experiences with child welfare when I would have involvements with them. And I went into the uh, the role of a county child welfare caseworker thinking I was going to save every child and family yeah. that I came into interaction with. And the fact is, is that the odds are stacked against you yeah. um, in that job. And there's so much you have to navigate. And you do, they obviously do the best they can on a daily basis, but it's people like us that I think need to do the advocacy at um, a higher level, you know, at the state and, and national level to mm-hmm. say, you know, if we really want to see outcomes for these children improve, we need to put further investments in the supports that's going to make it necessary. Yeah. Yeah. There's many universities in PA now with the foster ed that have a single point of contact who are there to assist with our foster care kiddos and providing those supportive services, like the year round housing, because that was a big one for me when I transitioned to college. It's well, campus closes. What do you do from there? Now they allow students to live on campus and then the food pantries being open and, you know, just providing all those services that kind of disappear once you leave the system. Cause it's, it's kind of like, congratulations, you're no longer a foster kid, but it's like, okay, now what do I do from here? Yeah, I mean, I think we can talk a little bit about transitioning out of the foster care system because there is such staggering um, data when you look at um, 
foster care youth compared to their peers in the general population. Um, so there's this really wonderful report that was produced in 2023 through the Annie E. Casey Foundation. It's its second installment of what they call their Fostering Youth Transitions Report. And it analyzed outcomes for foster youth at age 21 um, and where they are currently. Um, but from that data, we could see that only 79% graduated high school or attained a GED. Only 77% had stable housing and only 51% had full-time or part-time employment. And those are just some of the outcomes that are included in this massive report. But essentially what it's demonstrating is we need to be doing more to ensure that when youth are in foster care, they have the adequate transitional services and support network to help them successfully transition to adulthood, whether that be they're entering the workforce or they're going into um, you know, higher ed, um, whatever that may be. Um, I have some youth that say, hey, I did, um, you know, room and board and I didn't know how to do my laundry. I didn't know how to balance a checkbook. Um, I didn't know how to do this, the basic things of even running an apartment. Um, and it's sad that you have these youth that are spending time in foster care that don't know the basics of how to be independent. Um, so we really need to make sure that we're offering transition services to every youth as they are turning 14 and transitioning out of the foster care system, whether that be you know, 15, 16, or at the age of 21. Now, coming in with, you know, a, a support package or a care package, because I know when I was moving into college, it was so embarrassing for me to see how my roommates were setting up their dorm mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, how can we switch that around? How, how can we provide these kids with some type of normalcy for, I mean, because we already feel so outcast, let alone to it being right in our face. You know, they want to say they want to treat us normal, but then there was a time where I got a driver's license and everything just kind of went into chaos they were like oh my gosh Liz is not allowed to have her license that's a liability and she can't have a car and it's like hold up I was 18 when I got my license yes I'm still in the foster care system but I am choosing to stay in the foster care system I didn't have to be two I bought my car straight cash from working since I was 16 you're not about to take this car away and thankfully they didn't because I had a fight for it so we're we're trying to make us feel normal, but you're taking away what traditional students get to have from their day to day. So it's like, what makes us so different? Well, well, yeah, I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. Foster children often feel like outcasts. They are treated differently than their peers um, and they um, feel like they are bad or unworthy of the same treatment as you know other children. Um, and this really translates um, to how they are treated by stakeholders in the community. There's also this belief system by the community that they should be in foster care, um, whether it's to keep them safe or to fix something bad that they have done, which mm. is just categorically false. But I think this is why National Foster Care Month is so important because everybody has a role to play in helping to support foster children. You talked about things like higher ed, um, access to driver's license or, you know, whether it be access to your birth certificate. And ultimately, through the state legislature, there are many bills that are introduced to help support foster children. But I'm not sure that the public is overall aware that they've been introduced or are really advocating that they move through the process and get passed into law. So together, we can be working to identify what are those solutions and how can we get things into either statute or administrative policy that can correct some of this. Mm -hmm. I was I was definitely thankful to get a child profile done where they were able to obtain my birth certificate from my biological family, which was pretty cool. And then I also have one for when I was adopted, but that's another story in itself. Um, but you talk about stigma, which is, which is a big one when it comes to us foster kids, because there has been times where I will disclose that I was a foster child. And the first response I would get is you don't look bad. 
And other people have referred to us foster kids. And I say us because I identify in that group. I may not be a foster child now, but I have been for my entire life. So I put myself in that. They call us punks, punk kids. And now if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure I went to school with plenty of kids who acted out, who got suspended, who were in detention. And guess what? They were not in foster care. So why is that? Why do foster kids have such a stigma that they are bad, they're delinquent, they're juvenile, they're this and that and so forth? Well, I think that it's hard to change perception. Um, It takes time, but I think doing things like this where there are those that have successfully transitioned out of the foster care system and can share their story like you. Um, I often share my story that I grew up in a household that was filled with a lot of neglect. And when I was a teenager, I was um, then sent to um, live with my grandparents. And thankfully that happened because I think it changed the whole trajectory mm-hmm. of you know my entire life. Um, but I'm successful as well. I graduated college, I'm working in state policy. so. I think showing the success stories of what happens with children in the foster care system really helps, but then also dispelling a lot of those myths and really bringing a face to those kids that are currently in the system and saying they're not in in care because they are bad kids. Um, Often it's due to reasons that are not related to um, abuse, Mm -hmm. that they are worthy of having the same opportunities as your child or my child. Um, So I think it's just a collective um, way that we can work together to educate the community. What can we do as professionals to continue to support foster care students? Oh, well, there's so (laughs) much. What should we do? I mean, the first, and we've talked about this, I think at length now is listen to them, give them a voice, please please listen to us, Um, get to know them, understand their needs and their challenges and help them navigate systems. And this includes their biological parents. Again, those bio parents are not bad people. Sometimes all they need is some support systems in place, some community based programs to help get them back on track. Um, advocate for them, whether that be on a case level, on a local level in your district or your county, um, or on a state level, if you want to get involved in state advocacy, there's never enough voices at that table. Um, And we need to remember that we all have a role in prevention of child abuse and foster care placement. Um, So we need to work together and ensure that they're getting what they need and they deserve while they're in foster care. Um, And just understand the myths and misconceptions, help to bust them by sharing facts about the foster care system and step in and, you know, check somebody if they're saying, you know, something that's inaccurate with a true fact about what it looks like for kids in the system. But I know you said you were doing something, you talked about the youth voice thing, because I know you and I talked about, hopefully I can get in there. Kind of, yeah, we're we're really trying to infuse youth voice and also stakeholder voice into policy making across the chart. So, whether that be you know a foster child, or maybe it's a district liaison, or maybe it's a foster parent or a kinship parent, we're always looking for the lived experiences of those um, that have been through it to help guide us in shaping um, policy recommendations. Um, But some of the primary areas we're focusing on, starting from prevention through kind of more of the the, um, further penetration of the system is first is we want to look at how um, prevention efforts in the state can be improved to avoid the need for child welfare involvement, uh, especially when it's for a case of neglect and how uh, families can be served um, through social safety net programs instead of coming to um, the foster care system. So some of that work will be taking a concerted review of the Child Protective Services Law and general neglect bulletins to see where can we make improvements in that language so that counties can be freed up um, from working with families that don't necessarily need 
true child welfare intervention. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also looking at avoiding the need for group placement. So um, when I say group placement, I mean things like shelters and group homes. And that is really focusing on how do we increase access to kinship care as a preferred placement option. Um, there were some federal regulations that came down last year that are options for state to license kinship caregivers differently than stranger foster parents. Um, and it's to really decrease burden um, administratively or through things like training that are not necessary to license a family member to be um, a caregiver of a child. So we're looking at really pushing that forward um, with the state. Um, but in the education space, um, we're really excited because we're working with the Department of Education to review outcomes for foster children um, and comparing them to their outcomes for their peers in the general K-12 population. Um, I'm curious no to see that. You, Liz, I know. <laughs> there, there is very little data um, that is publicly available on outcomes for foster children. So we have requested data from um, the Department of Education, and our hope is that we would produce a fact sheet to talk about what those outcomes look like and really start to co the conversation around identifying those policy solutions to improving educational outcomes for foster children. I'm excited to see those numbers. I'll be calling on you. Yeah. Oh, I'll be there. I'll be willing for sure. But Rachel, just to uh, kind of bring our lovely conversation to an unfortunate end, um, I have enjoyed talking with you. And I also really do appreciate meeting you and you doing our lunch and learn session on Tuesday. And again, you know, since I was in the foster care system myself, this topic does hold a very, very special place in my heart. And I am so grateful that there is a program that works to ensure that stability piece and that there are other individuals out there who are stepping up every day to help us out and to help those students succeed in the most best way that they can. And I'm also grateful for you because you are doing some wonderful work. And so I do appreciate the opportunity to get involved and help raise awareness and support for our foster care youth. So let's keep working together, everyone, to make a difference. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Missy. And thank you to our audience listening and tuning in to another episode of Let's Have a Conversation and have a great day.